Hi, Chris Doherty here, technical editor for the RV Travel Channel and the Green RV Project. We talk about batteries being the foundation for our Green RV Project. When you are going to be out boondocking and you want to stay off the grid, having that source of energy is very, very important. And you're going to spend a, a pretty good amount of money on your battery system. Whatever batteries you get, you're making an investment. So trying to protect those batteries is very important. Our friends at Torquelift International have made a new product here which is very interesting and this is called the Power Armor Solar. This is a battery box it's made out of aluminum diamond plate and the idea behind this is that this is both a charger and a secure uh, lock box for your batteries. In some parts of the country people actually are stealing batteries off of RVs so this keeps them locked. So we'll take a look at the box here. Now this is available in either bright diamond plate or black plated. They were kind enough to, to provide us with the black painted one which matches our Coleman test coach uh, the best. And they have the Power Armor and the Power Armor Solar. The Power Armor Solar has a 10 amp solar panel built onto the top of the unit. Now uh, they offer this in a two battery and a larger size, so two size unit, so that you can fit multiple batteries inside and you can also put additional chargers on here. Now with this little 10 amp pa panel, there's no charger unit required uh, according to the company. However, if you add additional panels on here, then you are going to need to purchase uh, a separate accessory which is a small solar charger that goes inside the unit. There are three types of batteries to select from, flooded, gel, and AGM, or absorbed glass mat. Flooded batteries are the most common in RV use, and for good reason. First, they provide the most power. Second, they are the most economical. And third, they don't require a special charging apparatus, although they do benefit from the abilities of a three-stage charger, but more on that in a later episode. The biggest downside to flooded batteries are the maintenance requirement. Flooded batteries must have water levels maintained and must be cleaned occasionally to minimize corrosion. Also, flooded batteries that are discharged in below freezing conditions can freeze up and be destroyed as a result. Flooded batteries do best when carefully maintained and charged optimally, but repeated deep discharge can result in a slightly shorter lifespan. Gel batteries are sealed and maintenance free, which is a benefit to many RVers, and they do well in extreme temperature environments. AGM batteries, like the gel batteries, are maintenance free and will do well in high use, high discharge environments and in extreme temperature environments as well. As gel and AGM batteries are spill proof, they can be mounted upright or on their side. The downside to the maintenance-free batteries is that they produce less power and amp hours than the flooded batteries. As an example, the T105 batteries we have here are rated at 225 amp hours at a 20-hour discharge rate. The Group 24 AGM battery, which is only available in 12 volts, is rated at 76 amp hours per 20 hours, and the 6-volt gel battery is rated at 200 amp hours for 20 hours. So what do you have to weigh? First, total amp hours per battery versus deep discharges. Second, is maintenance free versus regular maintenance? And lastly, are you going to be using the batteries in extreme temperatures? Flooded batteries like our Trojan T105 batteries require distilled water be added regularly depending on use. A great way to do this in a clean, easy way is to install a battery watering system like Trojan's Hydrolink system. Once installed, like here in our battery box or in the battery compartment of your motorhome or other RV, to maintain the water level, all you have to do is hook up the pump, insert the other end into a jug of distilled water, and pump until you meet resistance. That's it, you're done. Occasional inspections and cleaning of the batteries will help ensure their long life, and spraying battery terminal sealer on the terminals will help keep corrosion down to a minimum. As an aside, the water ports on each cap will come off the caps pretty easily. We opted to use a small wire tie to secure each port once the installation was complete. And the battery straps also help to keep everything in place. We've discussed amp hours before and this is how battery capacity is measured. Amp hours are the amount of amps the battery can deliver over a set amount of time. Each battery will have its rating listed on the battery label 
So if you think about it, a 200 amp hour battery can deliver 10 amps for 20 hours, 20 amps for 10 hours, or 50 amps for 4 hours. As will be demonstrated in a later video, the incandescent lighting in our coach consumed 39 amps with all the lights on. So with a 200 amp hour battery, we could have the lights on for somewhere around 5 hours before the battery is depleted. The T105 6 volt battery can deliver 225 amp hours over a 20 hour period. In comparison, Trojan's standard Group 24 12 volt deep cycle flooded battery can deliver 85 amp hours over 20 hours. In order to use 6 volt batteries or multiple 12 volt batteries, they have to be hooked up together to make a battery bank. Here's how battery banks are connected. Batteries connected in parallel are additive of amp hours, but not voltage. So to use them in a 12 volt DC system, they can be used individually or wired in parallel to increase the amount of usable amp hours as shown here. Batteries connected in series are additive in voltage, but not in amp hours. So to use them in a 12 volt electrical system, you have to use two of them Wired in series is shown here, so the two add up to 12 volts DC. Now series parallel is used to increase the size of a series battery bank. Think of it like each pair of series connected 6 volt batteries are an individual 12 volt battery. So to keep increasing your amp hour capacity, you add more of these battery banks, so the voltage remains at 12 volts DC, but the amp hours increase as shown here. The entire Green RV project is designed to be customizable and expandable to fit budget and current and future power needs. One big piece of the system is cabling. Copper is very expensive these days, so expect to spend some money buying the larger conductors required to power an inverter system. This is the layout of the Green RV project we did using SmartDraw CL. This allowed us to see where we would be mounting components, what the wiring layouts would be, and keep the installation organized as we were doing the entire system at once, which was going to require working with a lot of cable. Keeping lengths in mind, we were able to use this plan to mount components in places that reduced cable runs while maximizing each component's capabilities. For instance, the inverter is installed in the front compartment, which kept the 2.0 gauge cable run to a minimum. Sizing the cable and buying the right cable is essential. Here are some thoughts. First, Oversize the wire if you can to allow for future expandability and to allow for a slight safety factor. Second, use only copper stranded wire like welding or battery cable sized appropriately for the amp load it will be carrying. Don't use CCA or copper clad aluminum cable if possible. Even though CCA is cheaper, it's harder to work with and get the terminal ends right. Third, how do you size the wire? Add up the amps it will carry and refer to a wire size table like this one. They can be found online or in the National Electrical Code. Fourth, always follow the NEC and the Recreation Vehicle Industry Association Code, which can be found in NFPA 1192 when installing systems on an RV. These codes represent best practices for building and installing systems in RVs and help to ensure that the system will work as intended with as little risk as possible to occupants from fire and electrical shock. And lastly, components like we're installing come with directions that outline things like circuit protection and cable size. Follow them closely and contact the manufacturer with any questions or before you alter the installation specifications. The torque lift power armor solar is designed to be installed across the trailer tongue in this application. But since trailer tongues come in many sizes, some fabrication may be necessary to install it correctly and is quite normal for accessories of this type. We were hoping to be able to fit the box in the existing battery tray. Upon the first test fit, after removing the LP tanks and the old batteries, we found that the power and LP lines going out to the tongue were in the way, so we relocated them. The second test fit was close, but we were still an inch off. In this case, we opted to use treated 2x8, secured in the old battery tray, to act as a base for the Power Armor Solar. It would have also been possible to cut off the old tray and weld on new ones, but everything here is well bolted and screwed down, so this works for us without having to do any welding and cutting to the trailer frame. 
The Power Armor Solar has slits in the bottom for the battery straps to go through and must be passed through before securing the box to the trailer. Also, we drilled out a couple of drain holes as battery boxes always seem to hold some water. To customize our installation, we decided to add battery through panel terminals to clean up our installation and minimize clutter in the box. We also installed the system's 250 amp fuse inside the box, which protects the wiring. We need this size fuse based on the size of the inverter, and we installed it in the box so that if something happened to the large cable and it shorted out, it would trip in here where it's protected. The fuse recommendations are also included in the inverter installation manual. Once the box was secured, we installed the batteries, hydrolink watering system, and the wiring. What is essential and what many RVers don't understand is that flooded batteries can freeze once they're discharged, which leads to crack plates and battery destruction. This chart shows the charge percentage rates and the temperature at which the batteries are safe. There are three ways to prevent this damage. First is, naturally, to remove the batteries completely when the coach is stored and keep them in a climate-controlled space. The battery should be fully charged before removal and before reinstallation or at least when the batteries are reinstalled. Second would be to leave the coach plugged into AC power all the time, thus keeping the batteries charged. Of course, if it only has a converter and not a three-stage charging system, the batteries can still be damaged. Lastly would be to have the batteries alone on a charge that would protect them through the winter months, and the Torque Lift Power Armor Solar does just that. While we have a solar charging system installed on this coach, as you will see in the next episode, when the RV is stored, it will be covered, thus making the solar panels on the roof inoperative. On the other hand, the Power Armor Solar will not be covered by the roof cover, and so it will be able to continue keeping the batteries topped off. It is important, however, that the batteries be disconnected inside the battery box or via a battery switch installed in the coach when it's stored to eliminate draw from parasitic loads like detectors, radio memory, and so on. There are a number of switches available and they can be found on Amazon.com along with most of the materials needed in the installations in this series. On the next episode, we'll talk about energy from the sun as we install a solar energy system from Grape Solar.